I guess some of you guys got it. Oh, hey. <laughs> I'm Dave, and uh, I don't have a cat, so I can't have a cat Zoom meet me. But um, uh, you guys, I guess some of you are familiar with me writing in the newspaper. I've been doing it for, I don't know, 15, 20 years now. But uh, I just put out a book through uh, Epicenter Press called Writing on the Edge. And I just happen to have a copy right here, I, like I planned it. And um, it's an anthology of contemporary Alaska writing. And I think it really follows what I've come to see over time as sort of mm -hmm. writing as a way of finding Alaska and discovering it in, in its varied ways. And um, I tried to do with this book sort of a comprehensive cross Alaska span of both fiction and nonfiction that present the state as I've sort of experienced it in my 33 years up here now. And um, so there's some really heavy hitters in there like Seth Kantner and Nancy, um, Nancy Lord and uh, Sherry Simpson and a few others. I was able to get Sherry to contribute before she passed away. And um, also some unknown writers that, uh, you know, are, are little known and uh, but that I felt had really worthwhile things to say. And if you're interested, it's called Writing on the Edge, an anthology of contemporary Alaskan stories. And you can read it for yourself and see what you think. But uh, I don't know if anyone wants to ask me questions, start kind of pushing where you want to go with this. Can anybody hear me? Hello. Yeah. Is, does anybody have Does anybody have questions about the book before I move on? Yeah, I do. Like, um, could you tell about your process of of selecting these people? Because I know you do a lot of reading, but um, you know. I, did you have to spend a lot of time reading things or had you oh. already read these things and decided that's what's going in? There's, there was a real mix. Um, so it started, uh, I don't know if any of you, probably some of you knew Lil Morgan. Um, she cold called me about, uh, oh, it was a few years ago now, and said I should write a book about uh, literature in Alaska. And I figured, you know, that my wife would probably buy one copy and that would be about as far as it went. And it wasn't something I really wanted to do, but then I thought about it and got back to her and said, well, what about a, an anthology of contemporary writing since I've reviewed so much? And she thought that was a good idea. And so we battered it back and forth. And once I realized that any kind of like comprehensive through even a century time of Alaska writing, it was going to just careen out of control so quickly that I didn't want to didn't want to go for such a wide net. And so I narrowed it down to stuff that's come out since I started reviewing Alaska books. I've been reviewing books since about 2001, but I started reviewing Alaska books in the news minor in 2006. And I think there might be one or two pieces in there that actually predate that, but I wanted to get post-millennium sort of sense of what Alaska is like right now for people who live here and not... Uh, not the reality shows and not the mythology that, that we all buy into because it's fun, but it's not really the Alaska that most people live on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. And so realism is what I really went for. As far as getting it together, um, I found every single author I approached was just incredibly uh, enthusiastic about being involved. Um, people, you know, I mean, writers want their work out there, right? We want to get promotion in this. This is the sort of thing that will sell people's own books by having a piece in there. Um, and uh, the the real hiccup was dealing with publishers because of getting rights and stuff. And that's where Lael was the lifesaver. That was one of the last things she did in her life was get this book pushed over the finish line. And uh, I can't I can't take full credit for it. I have to give Lael, you know, it, it wouldn't have happened without the effort she put in uh, a couple summers ago to get all that final paperwork done. Um, but when I started it, and it was also just kind of a rough period because my dad had just died and my mom was on the way out. And so it was kind of a, a rough period in my own life. And that sort of slowed the process down as well. But kind of some of the first people I reached out to looking in here were like, um, I definitely knew I wanted to get Colleen Mondor's book about bush piloting in Alaska. Um, 
in fact, I've got a quote from her in the in the front here from her book, The Map of My Dead Pilots. So she was one of the first ones I approached, and she was just so so enthusiastic about the whole idea that it kind of got me rolling. Um, Sherry Simpson was really, really helpful. And um, and so I just started grabbing pieces, grabbing books that I'd read and saying, OK, I think this works. I think that works. And then uh, kind of digging back through the library, looking into other books, you know, things that were current that I'd maybe read or maybe hadn't read, but probably should have. And and started slowly piecing it together. And uh, there's what, 30, 28, I think 28 entries, 24 entries in here. And uh, that's that's kind of how it came together. I have a question about the Bush pilot lady, um, Colleen, I couldn't under Colleen Mondor. repeat her last name. Mondor. So was she a Bush pilot, also a writer? Or? So she actually, her and her husband own um, a Bush uh, piloting company in the state. They now live in Washington, but divide their time between Alaska and Washington. And But she wrote this about her time working for a Bush pilot uh, operation in Fairbanks that she only refers to as the company. She never gives their name. And it's just, it's just this really dark piece um on darkly comical too on on bush piloting and and also on kind of the tragedies of it because she talks about the mistakes she talks in the book about a number of people she knew who died you know it's not a safe occupation by any stretch but um her writing is just so lively and actually i i was surprised you know it's like when you're a reviewer you'll see things and you're not sure if that's what the writer meant or not and um I happened to mention that I saw little touches of Jack Kerouac in her writing. And I got this long email back about how much she loves Jack Kerouac and blah, 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 blah. And William Burroughs this and Allen Ginsberg that. And I'm like, oh, we can really see eye to eye on what we read when we were young, you know. But um, it, it's a good book. I would I would recommend getting it. It's the best book I've read about bush piloting in Alaska. I mean, I haven't read all of them. And nobody, I don't think, has. But she's she's really captured a a feel for it that makes you sort of admire and kind of not be sure what to think about these guys at the same time because some of them are definitely you know just just pushing the edge and sometimes they push the edge right into the side of a mountain they have some great just let's see if i can find it here because she has some great sentences that just you know like she'll just be talking about someone and then he flew into a mountain just like casually like that's just part of what happens while well, he flew into a mountain and then and then it just goes on you know it's it's a very, very good book. Uh, I also wanted to get urban Alaska and um, because most of us live in the cities and that's something that the mythology of Alaska doesn't really account for. And I happened uh, during the time that I was starting to put the book together, I happened to read Rob McHugh's book. He's here in Fairbanks. He, he wrote this book called One Water. And it was for me the best book about living in Fairbanks because he bounces between the city and the rural area around it. And he's a cab driver by trade. And he wrote this essay about driving a taxi cab in Fairbanks in January on a 40 below night that is just very vivid and gripping story of who he encountered and what happened. And, you know, he, he says, oh, right, it's, it's a combination of several evenings, but this is his life, you know, as a cab driver in Fairbanks, and it captures a sense of just how weird this place is in January. You know, I mean, if you've ever gone to Fred Meyer on a 40 below night, which we were all doing right a month ago, uh, it's weird. It's just weird. And and I thought he captured that nicely. And then I also brought in Mary Kudinoff, who wrote about living in um, Mountain View in Anchorage and she grew up just incredibly impoverished and not even knowing who her father was until she was an adult and she lived in this really frightening apartment building in Mountain View and she wrote two sections in her book Threadbare that I merged together for the excerpt in here are about daily living in this apartment and how she mentions at one point you look through the through the storm fence and, and you can see that there's Alaska beyond, but meanwhile, you're looking at empty Mountain Dew bottles and, and crack pipes, you know, 
And that's part of Alaska too. And I didn't want to exclude that. Although I haven't personally experienced it and I'm, I'm glad not to. So any other questions before we go on? That a no. Did you personally know all the people that you included before you wrote the book? No, let's see. I knew Judy Ferguson. I knew Ned Roselle. Uh, I knew Christy McEwen, who uh, I, this is her first published piece that I wanted her in here. Uh, Rosemary McGuire lives right up the street from me. Uh, I knew Stan Jones, Nancy Lord, because we back and forth were both the book of yours in the Anchorage paper. Paul Gracie, I knew Rob McHugh, Molly Reddick, I know. Uh, Vicki Ho, I've met. I don't really know her. Uh, yeah. So, you know, probably about a third of them I had at least some some connection to beyond wanting to use their stuff in my book. Some of them like Seth, you know, I'd never talked to Seth. And so it was sort of like, God, what's he going to be like? He's this famous worldwide writer and, and Heather Lendy and Heather's as sweet in person as she is in her book. And Seth was just really like, yeah, yeah, let's do this, you know? And, and so it was very, very good in that regard. So people I didn't know, but, thought I should respect from their writing. I, I found that they met my expectations and exceeded them even. Anybody else have a, a question on the book? Um, what, I wouldn't call them wilderness writers. I would include like Seth and Nick Jans. Who did you include in that area of Alaska that are out running around in the wilds. So Nick Jans is in there um, and he was really good to work with too. And he's also good because he's a, um, he's a retired English teacher, right? So I got a, I got a corrected email back because I had a couple of typos in it and, or uh, something I'd written, I guess it was, it was the intro. He's like, well, you know, you got this wrong and you got the, uh, I was like, okay, thanks, Nick. Um, it's good to know because I, I can be sloppy at times. Um, John Waterman, who's written so much on climbing, I've got a section on his book, which is actually mostly about the 19, was it 1911? What year did the sourdoughs go up? 1910? 1910, right? It's about that climb, but he talked about his own 60th birthday climb and being an aging climber. And, and he's really kind of been the, the climbing writer in Alaska, even though he doesn't live up here. And uh, I didn't include whether he made the summit or not because I wanted people to buy the book, but he uh, he was in there on climbing and um, Bill Shawanet in the uh, in the Arctic, um, Christine Cunningham on going caribou hunting, uh, Lou Friedman on the Yukon Quest. I decided to go with that one instead of the Iditarod just because it's less known, although since then the Yukon Quest is kind of taken a tumble i hope it's it can be salvaged but i'm not sure it will be um, um vicky oh went backpacking by herself that's what that one's about seth Kantner, of course is looking for someone who got lost it's a title essay from swallowed by the great land uh if you consider the ocean to be real wilderness and dave atchison's in there um jill homer from the iditarod trail invitational riding her bike from the year she won the women's division She's a great writer. So that's a great book about if you want to get a sense of the trail from a firsthand perspective. And I think if you're on a bicycle, you just look at it in a way that a musher is not going to because you're, it's you, you know, you don't have any help. So it's a pretty good, pretty good story. Is someone about to speak? I see Lynn Slusher highlighted. Hello? Yes. Oh. Did I lose you? No, no, I'm I'm here. I just let's see. <clears throat> I'm here. Did you have a question? No. 
No, okay. I'm sorry. You, you your your screen lit up, so I didn't know if you had to want to. Okay. Ask me. Yeah. So, are there other questions about the book? You know, I mean, is I think, you know, my like I said at the start, my writing <clears throat> sort of gravitated towards, you know, like I do a lot of profiles along with a lot of literary reviews, and my writing is, I think, without really intending to, at the outset, sort of found its way into just exploring who we are as people, you know, and not, not the myths and not the, not the uh, imagery, but just what's everyday life like, because we're, we're kind of normal in some ways, and we're kind of pretty distinct in other ways. And it's been kind of fun to explore this through meeting people and hearing about their lives and, and maybe telling their stories. What about native voices? Um, so yeah, there's several in there. Um, it filtered through uh, Judy Ferguson, but Fred Johns in there writing about his walks across the state to raise awareness on native issues. Uh, Christy, I brought in specifically because it's a piece she initially posted just as a Facebook post uh, right at the height of all the George Floyd protests. And she's, um, she's Yupik. And she wrote this essay about her cuspic and growing up with it is this beautifully written piece. It's quite brief. Um, she had here 53. I could read this if you want me to, because I just, let's see, that's Tom, because uh, you guys want me to read it, I can read it. It's about two pages, two and a half pages is all. But I just, I love the way she sets this up. She says, I remember as a girl sitting on the edge of my grandmother's bed next to what it felt like a mountain of cuspid. As I tried on every cuspic made by my grandmother, I felt rich. I felt like the richest girl in the world. And now I look back and see I was surrounded by a richness that went much deeper than the cotton print on my cuspic. I learned to sew from my grandmother, who we all called An, which is mother in Yupik. I sat very still next to her, quietly observing everything she did without instruction or reminders. I knew that if I wanted to be near her and learn from her, I couldn't disturb her work. I had to remain silent and still. I did not ask questions, talk, or fidget. I knew that I was responsible for my own learning and how carefully I observed and remembered the motions of An's hands. While she worked, my grandmother knew that she was my teacher and that she was equally responsible for my learning. An was an expert teacher while never speaking a single word. As I sat with An, the room was full of the sound of the rhythm of her work, the needle puncturing the fabric, the thread as it was pulled through, pulled then stopping at the knot, her fingers folding, gathering, and smoothing the material. The way she would wet the end of the thread before guiding it through the eye of the needle, her breathing, her gentle grunt at making an error, her deep sigh of satisfaction when her work was complete, and then, also without an exchange of words, I had a needle, thread, and scraps of fabric to try to sew for myself when I was ready. And the evidence of my careful observation was proven in how my fingers could do what my eyes had taught me after watching on skilled tasks repeated again and again, hour after hour. Just as my sewing skills were, okay, well, so that's the end of that section. So she sets you up right there. And it's this, Christy is not a writer by profession, and she should be. Um, she sets you up right there in this home, and you just to me, I felt right at home in this story as she as she told it. I felt just this beautiful sense of of belonging that she had with her grandmother. She says, just as my sewing skills were burgeoning, my mom, sisters, and I moved away from Bethel and on. And through the following, and though the following times I was able to watch her sew were rare, I know that still today my hands work the same way that On's hands modeled for me. My love for working with my hands turned to music. After graduating with a degree in music education, I became a music teacher in Fairbanks. Because of the way that I learned all throughout my life, I relied so much on the experts around me. I watched, I observed, and I listened to other teachers. And today, I still try to apply those generous, what those generous and adept mentors demonstrated. Just like many of you, my schooling was full of racism. The daily stings and deep bruises caused by words spoken and unspoken and actions and inaction fueled by hate and ignorance still feel like fresh wounds. But the racism I experienced once I became a teacher hurt in a different way. It is a different way to bear those same insults and violations as a professional, especially as an educator. 
because as a child, I once looked to my teachers to correct, condemn, and protect me from the racism that flourished in my schools in Fairbanks. After a particularly awkward and hurtful encounter with a racist colleague, I made a decision. This is where, where we made some changes because she didn't want a, the individual to be identifiable. I made a decision and oath a promise that I would wear a cuspic to school every day of my teaching career. I wanted every person I encountered to see me as an Alaska Native woman, as a Yupik first. I wanted my students, particularly my Alaska Native students who were learning in the same racist environment that I was working in, to see their teacher as an Alaska Native, as a Yupik first. This is where it began to really hurt my feeling, or not hurt my feelings, but just really tear at my heart because I've known Christy for years. She was my kids' music teacher. Her husband, Malcolm, I've known even longer through the bike club here. And um, I think of her in her cuspic, I, like, like I can't, I mean, if you go to her house, she's not wearing it, but when I see her in public, that's what she's wearing. And it's so much part of her identity to me. And she has such a beautiful smile to boot, you know, and to think that somebody would somehow find something negative in that is, is I can't understand it, you know, but, but they do. She says, when colleagues and then students and colleagues ask me why I wear a cuspic every day, I often cheerfully respond with, it's so fun to wear clothes that you make and I recall those who shared their precious cuspic patterns and secrets with me, as well as the hours of trial and error of creating my own designs. And sometimes I answer, those are so practical. Look at this pocket. The garment is the predecessor of the hoodie and parallels the design and function of the anorak or anorak of the Inuit. I'm not sure how to pronounce that correctly. The looks of the Inupiaq and the... That's uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try and pronounce this of the Khoikhan. I, I can't speak the language. Or I might answer they are so comfortable because one can dance, harvest, hunt, celebrate, work, and play in a cuspic, especially when it is made just for you. Well, those are all true answers. The question of why I wear a cuspic every day, uh, of why I or to the question of why I wear a cuspic every day, they are not the true reason. I wear my cuspic to remind you that Alaska Natives are thriving professionals. We are people deserving of dignity and respect. We contribute to our communities every day. Our cultures are beautiful and alive. We are witness to the racism and justice that goes unchecked, and we are resilient and enduring. We are still here on Indigenous land. When you interact with me, you must do so fully aware that I'm a Yupik woman and that I stand here or I stand here with thousands of years of ancestors behind me. When I wear my cuspic, I stand testament to my grandmother on all her kindness and patience and courage and strength and knowledge and wisdom and power and love and dignity and righteousness mm. through my blood too. My cuspic mm. is my armor, my shield, my protection, my comfort, my refuge. David James, reading. What does it mean when you wear a cuspic? So that's Christy Minquin McCoon. Min Min, she's using her native name. I'm not good with it yet. But, um, oh, okay. but I just felt that she did this beautiful job in, in two pages of telling you where she came from and a real piece of her identity and how that identity was attacked and how she is not going to let that identity go and why. And when you reach the end of it, she asks you, what does it mean to you? So she, then she she pushes it back onto the reader and not she doesn't leave you with a this is how you must think you know she leaves you having to think and I hope she be, pursues writing more because that's one of the reasons I put her in there was because I want to get her to write more she's got a good voice. I also, to answer your question, Lynn, further, um, there's also stuff from uh, Alexis Bunton, who wrote this book called So How Long Have You Been Native? And she worked in a summer uh, Klingit run tourism business for two summers uh, for her PhD research in Sitka and met the tourist boats and took them out on what was called, there were Tundra tours or native tours. I can't remember the name of it now, but uh just sort of works around the idea of of sharing native culture and where does it where is it sharing and where is it selling and and how do you find that balance and also just the the gulf and I can't remember I think it's in this chapter that I excer excerpted I haven't read this book in over a year now but um she uh she, one of her coworkers who's who's a Klingit was asked by a tourist 
So how long have you been native? Which ended up being the title of her book. And mm -hmm. uh, and she's got a great sense of humor and some wonderful insights. She was really great to work with. And she's um, she's down in the lower 48 now, but she, uh, she was all about being in here. And then uh, Deesa Jacobson, she's no longer alive, but Monty Francis, who's a San Francisco-based journalist, had caught some pretty extensive interviews with her. And I excerpted some of those. She was a native activist down in Anchorage for quite a few years and um, just really talks about, you know, the role, especially for native women that have gone missing or murdered. Uh, that's, that's a problem and it needs to be addressed. So, so was this Alexis Vantinek uh, entry in your book? Is it from her whole book, or is it yeah, it's, something it's the else? Yeah, it's chapter out of the book. It's the chapter for July, okay. which she titled "Meeting the Tourist Gaze," which is about trying to connect with tourists and and share culture and and not, you know, like like where's the balance? That's what she's trying to find, and and not, you know, to kind of destroy their own culture in this process of selling it. And how do you do this? And she was looking at how, you know, she's doing her PhD work on how do you make uh, cultural tourism productive and helpful to the culture and not exploitive of it. I think that year I listed that as my favorite book. Every year the ADN has me do your favorite books and of the year. And that was my favorite one that year for sure. It's pretty funny. There's some of it that's very funny, but also very thoughtful. Um, in, in, uh, 1995, I, I, uh, published a, uh, uh, a general, uh, bibliography of, uh, Alaska, and I've got the impression of, of, uh, generations of, of writers. Uh, would you have any, uh, 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 opinions about, uh, how the, uh, uh, generation, uh, uh, comes and goes, uh, and uh, you know, if we see uh, individuals uh, uh, pass on, uh, and we know about their, their their history in many cases, but it seems to me that um, there there are some special things about each of the generations. And I wonder if you have any uh, uh, ideas about that. Hmm. Now, by generations, you don't mean like children of writers right you mean like just each successive no s essayists mostly but but i mean more like just like the era the period yeah, yeah yeah well i mean there's definitely a shift going on into um into the 21st century you know i think alaska had that mythological last frontier uh feel to it and I think a lot of writers kind of played to that and, you know, usually to good ends, but, um, you know, I think we're becoming more of an urbanized and more of a, a diverse state. I mean, it's always been a very diverse state actually, but I think we're becoming more so in that regard. And I think the writing is really reflecting that right now that there's, you know, more, uh, native writers definitely coming out. I just, you know, I just reviewed Lily, uh, to, to, to Roy looks books. I, I I'm so bad with names, but she has a new novel out uh, set in the 1890s uh, with the Inupiaq, and um, really powerful novel. And the thing that I want to see, and it's just because after doing this book, I could not find a black writer. I could not find a good, active black writer in Alaska that could contribute on the black experience of being an Alaskan and I think that's a huge void in this book if there's a second edition and I can find one or preferably two or three I would want to put them in because uh, I think that's an area we need to understand like like we've not I, I just reviewed black lives in Alaska that Ian Hartman and David Reamer put together and I reviewed Ian Hartman's earlier version of that book uh, a year or so back and you know, one of the things Ian dug up was that the whalers in the 1840s, a lot of the guys on whaling ships were escaped slaves, okay? And this is when Alaska was still run by the Russians. And here we are connected to the slave era 
of America, because after Dred Scott, one of the safest places a escaped slave could go was onto a whaling boat that was gone for three or four years. You know, the slave catchers weren't going to catch him, right? And so that drove all these men into whaling, and some of them were among the first United States, so well, they weren't even legally citizens at the time, but some of them were among the first people in the United States to see Alaska. And we don't even think about them being here. We just say, oh, whalers, and we all think, oh, you know, we think white guys, we think British, right? Um, but no. And so I'm curious now, I'm, I'm, it's driving me nuts. What's, what, was, what was their impression? What was their life like on these boats? And what were they seeing through those eyes, having escaped a plantation, worked their way through the United States, gotten onto a ship, sailed around South America and come up the other side and come to Alaska? You know, it's, it's just a life that's hard to imagine. And you start right there and, you, and you've got this whole history of black people in Alaska that have been doing things all the way along. And, you know, we don't hear about it. it this should be. It's part of our history. It's part of everyone's history up here. So that's that's an area I'd like to see growth in. I don't know if I answered your question though. Yeah. Um, as far as generations go, um, I mean, I think it's just it's following the national trends in a lot of ways. You know, people are just starting to really look at look at social disparities and, and writing about them. Um, wh and one I, thing that this, I don't think has been written up very much are all the uh, uh, miners uh, that came from abroad, um, and uh, many of them had just got off the boat, as it were. Uh, one thing that I was surprised about was uh, uh, I looked at the um, uh, the uh, 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 individuals working um, in some of the big miners um, that uh, came from uh, Russia, not from the Russian uh, America period, but uh, from the White Army uh, when the, the Reds took over, and they came, and many of them came and uh, uh, worked in in the uh, uh, in the mines. Uh, they had no family with them, uh, and uh, they just kind of had a life that uh, petered away, and nothing was left. Uh, if you go to the first uh, uh, first uh, mines uh, around Fairbanks, uh, especially the ones that uh, before the dredges, uh, the ones that were down under the land uh, uh, in tunnels, um, uh, not awful long, a lot of those folks were recent uh, 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 folks who came from uh, Eastern Europe uh, and and uh, other places uh, very far away from Alaska. And so, I, you know, I haven't seen much that deals with uh, that kind of population. You know, Judy Ferguson has done a lot of oral histories with families from um, the Balkans. And right. She had those out uh, probably late 2008, 2009, somewhere around there. She put it out. It was, the book was a little too unwieldy, I thought. And I told her she should have split it into two because she had one half was was uh, uh, oral history memoirs. And the other half was uh, uh, kind of her own experiences in uh the Balkans during the wars there in the nineties, but she, um, she really dug into that. And, you know, you see these, these names, you know, baggage, <laughs> the family came right out of the Balkans, you know, and we have a lot of these names, Stepovich around the state. These are families that came here from that part of the world. It's actually been a huge feeder for uh, immigrants coming into Alaska. Or at least it was in the early 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. Her book on, um, she did a book recently on uh, um, the Iditarod, the first Iditarod racers, the natives that started it. And it's just such a different Iditarod. It's a really fun book to read because it's not professional. It was just a big gathering almost, you know, they're telling their stories about just going across rural mm -hmm. Alaska and, you know, they're kind of halfway racing and they're halfway just visiting family and friends and having a good time along the way. And it just wasn't so serious, you know? 
and it's kind of a of a lost of a lost race, unfortunately. It's not so distinctively Alaskan anymore, and not so distinctively Alaska Native anymore. David, I know you have a uh, section in the book that you have written, and you haven't said anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us a little bit about it? Just, just you know, I mean, it started when they were getting ready to reissue uh, Terrence Cole's Wheels on Ice, and Frank Sos and Jessica Cherry were behind that, and they wanted to get contemporary cycling um essays and frank reached out to me and i said yeah no i don't think i have anything to say and just sort of set it aside and frank being frank just kept sending me these gentle nodding emails about how i really should do something and finally one day i went out riding uh this was in the fall of 2020 and i just the whole summer had been hard you know it was hard for everyone and i got on my bike and i knew snow was coming and this was the last dry ground ride of the year and I just kept going and going and going, just me and my dog. And I just kind of thought about my whole, how I ended up in Alaska and how I ended up doing everything. My whole life has just been basically one thing after another that I've just sort of stumbled into. I haven't done anything by planning, but uh, it was a chance to kind of talk about how the trails work in interior Alaska and how cycling has sort of become this thing that when I came up here, you know, mountain biking, especially in the winter, nobody did that except for a few of us. And And now, you know, it's what like 90% of the people I run into out in the Valley are on bikes. You know, this is, this has been a big trend. And I think I hate to say it, but I think it's probably going to overtake dog mushing at some point. Cause it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to keep a bike than a dog yard, you know? And my, my neighbor, Peter has been involved in the Yukon quest for years and he's, he's just kind of like wondering if it's going to last much longer. I was talking to him the other day. I asked him if the, he thought the two sides could get it back together to make an international race again. And, he said that he feels that people are just getting out of it because it's just too expensive and there's just too much, too many hurdles to getting a dog team to the starting line. And um, so it's sort of like I'm watching this thing that I really fell in love with when I came up here because the Iditarod was one of the things I just jumped on immediately. And I'm watching it kind of fade, but I'm also realizing that I'm part of what's brought that about and my writing has contributed to that. So it's kind of a, kind of a, mixed blessing i guess you know but it has been fun to be involved with biking for so long and, and to see this big technological surge that came about 15 years ago and suddenly you know instead of like 15 of us around town that were always run running around the trails and periodically running into each other and, and being the only guys on bikes and suddenly you know everybody's out there doing that and and that's kind of fun to see but that's that was sort of what i wrote about and just sort of like my own life and getting into Alaska and, and why and how it all happened. I was kind of going through a retrospective period at that time, which isn't very common for me. So for me to be reflective at all is, you know, not my gig. <laughs> so yeah, memoirs aren't normally my writing thing. That was an experiment. I'd rather write about you guys. And we're glad of that. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that there's you haven't found any black writers, and one of the when I came up to Alaska the first time to work for the summer of the Denali Highway, it was '69. It was still the only road into Denali National Park, right. and I was absolutely mind boggled to see so many black people out camping and stuff because it wasn't. What I was used to from the Pacific Northwest area, so right. much the Seattle area. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it was like, whoa. And I didn't stop to realize that most of those people were military people. They came up, to the, you know, were in the military and uh, and then retired and stayed in Alaska. And it seems mind boggling that uh, there aren't, there's got to be black authors out there um, and all the different adventures and things that they would have with whatever. You know, like the military, their military practices and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Hmm. Uh, Olivia Hill, who doesn't live in the state anymore, but she keeps a home up here. She's written a book, um, Travel North, Black Girl, about working in a village as a teacher. And her husband was white, her ex-husband, 
that she came together and they had that pretty messed up marriage. And so they decided to come to Alaska and live in a village to fix it. And and that's not ever a good move, <laughs> but they were young, you know, I, I interviewed <laughs> her an article after I read the book, she was really, really wonderful woman. I, I really enjoyed talking with her, but, um, uh, you know, as soon as I saw that one, I just grabbed it because it's like, let's let's get this out here. You know, like, hey, there's there's black people here. Let's here's what they do. Let's let's let them have their say, you know, and 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 I can do that as a reviewer, you know, kind of publicize this, let people know. I mean, I was thinking about the cover of. Um, do I have it handy right here? Oh, the Black Lives in Alaska. No, that's not it. I'm not sure what I did with it. Um. But, uh, you know, it's these two black whalers from, you know, the picture's over 100 years old, right on the front cover. And I was thinking about for a black kid in Anchorage walking into a store and seeing that book and seeing here's black guys in Alaska at the very earliest stage. I think that will change their thinking, you know, just to see that picture. You know, these kids maybe don't feel like they're a part of it, but they are. We're all part of it, even the people that may be mad. <laughs> how about hispanic culture yeah that's you have any limited up here hispanic? as well and i don't know that i really tried on that regard um you know i did a, a long run of articles in the news miner on immigrants in fairbanks and there's certainly a latin population here um again they're not real vocal and so you know that's just it's it's really hard to find some of this stuff and i wish people would speak out because i think you know there's a lot of venues i mean the thing about alaska and fairbanks is that you know you don't have to be good you just have to be willing to do it and and people will print you because <laughs> i mean that's essentially how i started you know was i just started writing and and it was very easy to get into publication up here which wouldn't necessarily be the case in seattle area where i grew up and um and from there, it's just what you do with it. You know, I just kept pushing at it and finding that I enjoyed doing it. And so I just kept at it. And now I have a book that I didn't plan on. <laughs> I didn't plan on any of it. So you don't have a degree in English, or? Well, it's I have a um, broadcast journalism degree. So I did... TV work mostly in college. And by the time I graduated, I met so many people that had come through to talk to us about the television news industry that I didn't want to be a part of it because I'd never seen egos on parade quite like that. You know, some guy from Yakima, Washington, which is not a big town. And you'd think he was, you know, king of the universe. He was so impressed with himself. And I just didn't want to work with these people. And so I just took off and hit the road instead. And I lived in Seattle for a couple of years and then went on the road and ended up in Alaska. And, um, and then sort of rebooted from there, got on to KUAC. So that was the first time I really put my degree to work was just spinning records and then uh, started writing for the Esther Republic first and then got picked up by the news miner and it just kind of went from there. So, but it's just, it's just, it's really, I think people can get as much out of Fairbanks as they're willing to put into it because there's all kinds of availabilities here and very few people competing with you for it. And so if you push yourself out there, you know, next thing you know, you're asked to do an at-home learning conference on a Monday afternoon. You know, you have a book, you have a you <laughs> have columns in Alaska Magazine and Anchorage Daily News and the Fairbanks paper. And, you know, you just, you just all over the place. And I still don't feel like I've tried that hard. <laughs> I just feel like it's just happened, you know? So. I, I, this is Darlene Masiak. I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed your um, series in the News Miner um, about immigrants that live in Fairbanks. And I felt it was a opportune time in the environment in the United States to actually have all those articles in our paper. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, it was, you know, I mean, I've traveled a lot, you know, I just, I mean, I, I came to Alaska because I wanted to make money to go to Guatemala. I didn't come to Alaska thinking I would stay here, you know, uh, but um, things happen. 
I did get to Guatemala, but I, I spun around and beat a path back up as fast as I could the following spring. But, um, you know, that experience of traveling had me really understanding what it's like to be an outsider in another country. I've been in, I don't know, 15, 18 countries. I don't know how many. And what was interesting to me was, you know, what is it like to come to America and to come to Alaska in particular as a as a immigrant and i started it in 2014 so it was before the political situation kind of went sideways and kind of by 2016 i was thinking ah, i've probably done enough with this maybe do something else and then the the trump campaign started going and they were attacking immigrants and that was when i just decided i'm sticking to this come hell or high water and putting these stories out here because these are our neighbors our teachers our co-workers our business owners Tarek Khan, who owns some um, Spice It Up, was one of the most intense stories I've covered in terms of his life. He he escaped the Swat Valley when the Taliban were moving in. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, we hate Muslims. Well, if you meet Tarek, you can't hate Tarek. You know, he's such a kind person. And um, and now he's a business owner and he's an employer in our community, you know, and you, you blink twice and and this person you were condemning five years ago has now got your teenager getting paid, you know, that was kind of what I wanted to convey. And um, I think, I hope I was successful with that. I think it was 2019 that I finally dropped that one because uh, part of it was, it was just really hard to find people. And, you know, people a lot of times were hesitant to share their stories and I can understand that, especially the way the environment's been. Um, it's a lot easier. I've been doing artists and writers and creative types, and it's a lot easier because they all want to sell things. So they're more than happy to get you to write them up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lynn can account for that. And, um, and if you guys know anyone, send them my way. Cause it, I actually appreciate when people reach out to me and say, can I, can I get in there? Cause it saves me looking for someone, but, um, I'm glad I did that. You know, at, at one point I was thinking about doing a book through UA Press, but I don't know. It, it just changed so rapidly that I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't really keep it uh, in the moment. You know. So. Well, I I think you were successful with what you did with that series. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope I hope a lot of people did because that was what I wanted. And again, you know, it's like I said, it's this angle, who are we as a people? You know, we're all these different people. There's there's no one way to be an Alaskan. And when people say, well, this is Alaskan and this isn't, it's like, well, where do you get that? What is and isn't Alaskan, you know? So, so I came in late, so I hope I'm not being redundant, but... Um... Have you, uh, do you write not uh, fiction? Fiction? Or, or yeah. No, I don't have the mind for it. I mean, you, you've got to have the imagination and I just don't. Have you published any non other nonfiction books or is this your first book that you've published? This is the first book, I've been in books. I'm in Wheels on Ice and I was in some, um, I forget the name of it now. It was like 15 years ago. It was like a satire book that she picked up a couple pieces I'd written and threw them in there. Mostly I've just been in the newspapers and magazines. So. But, you know, it reached the point, I guess, you know, you, you wonder whether you're doing well enough or not. But when you reach the point, like Alaska, Susan at Alaska Magazine reached out to me and asked me to write for her, which was pretty, you know, I, I was pretty um, humbled by that, you know, because that's a national magazine. That's That's something I hadn't had before. And um, and that she felt I was good enough to get in there. I guess I'm doing something right. So I don't think, you know, I think there's better writers. I mean, I started and ended this book with Ned Rosell because I think no one can tell a story like Ned Rosell in 700 words and um, make you feel like you've lived through a whole world in just that short column. And uh a lot of the writers in here are just really good. I think Nancy Lord's the best in the state as far as just being able to put more into a single paragraph than it takes me a thousand words to say. She just has an amazing talent with the language and uh, just a, an incredible mind to put that talent to.
Any other questions? I will be at uh, Barnes and Noble on the 11th of March signing copies. And if you happen to be in Anchorage this weekend, I will be at Tidal Wave from one to three on Saturday. And I think it's again, one to three at Barnes and Noble the following week. I got to check my emails. Um, and then this summer, I'm going to try and get some of these seminars going with different writers and just have a talk about writing in Alaska. I, mean, I feel like my skill set's more towards curation and um, getting ideas out than doing it myself. Does that make sense? Uh, David, I'd like to do another plug for the the fire side book. Um, shop in Palmer. I you can order David's book through um the Fireside bookshop. I don't know what the official title is and you can do it by phone. Um you do have to pay for the shipping. It's not like Amazon, but it's supposed to be a really, really good book uh you know uh, small bookstore and and it, once you order from them, you get these wonderful emails every week about all the new things coming out, especially books in Alaska. So right. it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, and Homer it's, books it's really nice. as well uh, is real good to work with. I've worked with them a few times, just like especially during the pandemic. You know, uh, I was like, I don't want to give my money to Amazon. They're making plenty of money, but Homer Bookstores got their doors locked right now. I'm going to buy my books from them, you know. And so I went through her. It was really hard to watch Gulliver's go away here in Fairbanks. I felt like I I walked in there, you know, and I, it wasn't just like there was books. I knew everybody working there, and I missed that interaction. It's nice to go into a store and everybody's like, "Hey, Dave, how you doing?" You know, I get that some places, but not everywhere. Bike shops, I think, are the only other places. We're getting near the end of our session. Does anyone have any other questions? Sorry, I'm not a little more organized. I just kind of, I've never done anything like this. I mean, this is this is new to me, so I'm kind of winging it. Well, you did great for winging it. Um, I agree. <laughs> And I just like pretty much the way 50 copies the of the what's that yeah, <laughs> pretty much the way all the authors have done quite often talk about the book that they just finished or the, the, the way they do things. Yeah, I thought it was seemed like you've done it before. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, it was delightful, David. And uh, I think sometimes you underrate yourself as a writer. Um, I just know from when you did the interview for me when I was just chattering, going all over the place, I don't know, you held that article together. You somehow make sense of everything. And No, I've uh, done so many just... of those that, and it's, it's sort of a sense of like, like I, the way I like to do it, and it's not the most economical way as far as time goes, but I like to just sit down with the person and really get to know them. And um, that time spent has really more impact on the, how the article goes than the um the the interview itself because I get a sense of the person and then when I start going through the interview and taking my notes I'm really looking for two things in particular a really good quote that can open the paragraph if you if you check my articles they always open and close with a quote from the person I've interviewed and the first one sort of like gives this way in something that's going to grab the reader. I want to get to know more about this individual and in the end, something that's kind of summarizing of their work or whatever the interview went. And then I start piecing it in, in between. And uh, when I'm taking notes, I mean, like my whole conversation today has been totally chaotic. Uh, I'm terrible at maintaining linear thought processes as a talker. It's one of the reasons why when I'm on KUAC, I just list the numbers 
I, I saw that. I just list the numbers and uh, or I, mean, I list the songs and and I put the music back on because if I start talking, I sound stupid. But um, uh, you know, when I uh, when I put together a story, I'm just grabbing all these little pieces and in my notes, I'm arranging them chronologically, and then I'll kind of work that in so that you might have said something to me, Lynn, and 20 minutes later, you reference it again in another aspect, but I've just stitched the two together and said, this is a great quote, and you said it, and, and uh, you know, I am careful in terms of context, you know, like if it was, you know, like, like if there's something that, that that comment was to a different context, I'm not going to tie it to the original one, even if they sound similar, because that's not what you intended, you know what I mean? But if you were back on the same topic again, if you'd worked your way back to it and said, oh, and then there's this, and I shoot that back at the earlier stage and just sort of tell a story. And, and I do think I can kind of tell a story on the page. I can't do it verbally, but I can do it in words and print. <laughs> 